like everyone in the audience to take a moment and think about the term virtual reality and what comes to your mind. Now, some of you may immediately think of the Star Trek holodeck and Data and Geordi solving Sherlock Holmes mysteries or Captain Picard experiencing the 1920s. Others of you might think of the Matrix and how users like Neo plug their brain into a computer, which creates sensory stimuli so realistic that they don't realize that the virtual world that they're in is virtual. Now, Hollywood has sensationalized virtual reality over the years through movies like The 13th Floor, uh, Lawnmower Man, Minority Report. But many of you might not know that virtual reality began in the 1960s. In 1965, Ivan Sutherland, who's the father of computer graphics, wrote a paper called The Ultimate Display, where he described display technology that could create a, an experience so realistic that a bullet could be fatal. Now, three years later, he and his students created the first head-mounted display, or HMD. This device delivers two distinct perspective images to each of the user's eyes, providing a 3D stereoscopic vision. Okay, this is what gives you your depth. In addition, though, as you can see at the top of the head-mounted display, they also used a mechanical tracking system to track the motions of the user's head. What this allowed them to do was as the user moved their head, they could update the computer graphics to change the user's perspective of the virtual world. Now, since then, virtual reality has continued to evolve in research labs all across the globe. Uh, our head-mounted displays are, have gotten much better. Uh, we've also created new types of displays, such as auditory displays, uh, haptic displays that can provide tactile and force feedback, even olfactory displays for displaying smells to you. Um, we've also investigated new types of input devices, devices specifically targeted at creating more realistic interactions with these virtual worlds. Now, all of these technologies, ever since the 1960s, has primarily only existed in research labs. However, in the past couple of years, companies such as Oculus VR and Samsung and many other industries are looking at using this consumer technology, which is sitting in your pocket probably right now, and leveraging these high-resolution small displays to bring virtual reality to the masses. I'm about to show you a video of the Oculus Rift Development Kit 2, also known as the DK2. Um, what this allows the user to do is get a perspective image of the virtual world. So in the upper right-hand corner, you're going to see the visuals of the virtual world that my PhD student, Jack, will see while he's uh, using the head-mounted display. So you'll notice, as Jack moves his head in the real world, the visual stimuli from the virtual world correspond with his physical movements. This gives him a sense of being immersed in the virtual world. Now, it's not just about head rotations. You'll notice as he leans, the system also updates to these leaning motions, these translational movements. This gives him the sense of being in the virtual world. He can even stand up. He can also walk around. These technologies are amazing, and they're really changing people's perspective of what virtual reality can be. However, this technology is still limited. If you'll notice, for one, Jack is tethered to the computer that he's walking around. Notice he has to slowly maneuver around the cord to make sure he doesn't jerk the, desk, uh, the laptop off of the desk. Additionally, if you'll notice here, as Jack bends down, his visual stimuli didn't match his physical movements. The reason was because Jack was outside of the field of view of the camera, which is used for the translational tracking. So as you can see, while this technology is really pushing the boundaries of virtual reality, there's a lot of limitations that we still have to overcome. So here at UT Dallas, we've been looking at ways to overcome these limitations. Essentially, we've been using the UT Dallas Motion Capture Lab, which consists of 16 Vicon infrared cameras. These cameras we use to track retroreflective markers that we place on the user's head, the user's hands, and the user's feet. This essentially allows us to track the user in a tetherless mode, so they're no longer connected to a computer, they're free to walk about anywhere they want to. And thanks to the Motion Capture Lab, it's a very large tracking space. It's four meters by four meters. So as opposed to the small, maybe four foot by four foot area that Jack was dealing with before, he now has a much larger space. To demonstrate what we can do with this, here's a video. So you'll notice that Jack can look around the world just like he could with the DK2. 
However, now things have changed. Jack is no longer constrained to being in one small little space. He feels free to walk around the environment, just like he would the real world. Not only can he walk around the environment like he does the real world, he can also do things like crouch down. So anything that you can do in the physical world, we can now do inside of virtual reality because we are tracking the user's full body. But what's this? Jack also has hands. Because we are tracking Jack's hands, we can now create what are known as 3D interaction techniques so that Jack can use his virtual hands to interact with the virtual world the exact same way he would with the real world. Notice as he puts boxes on the bed of the operating room, he can even walk over and turn the switch on to the x-ray machine and turn it back off. So as you can see, we are drastically going beyond the limitations of the modern virtual reality system. However, this technology is still limited. This is limited because we are constrained to the lab. We are constrained to using 16 Vicon cameras to track the user's motions. Obviously, we would love for everyone to have a Vicon tracking system in their home, but that's not feasible. So we've been looking at alternatives of how we can deliver that immersive experience to your home without having to use optical tracking. Our solution is to use inertial measurement units. Um, this is known as an IMU. It consists of a three-axis accelerometer, a three-axis gyroscope, and a three-axis magnetometer. When we fuse the information together from those three sensors, we can accurately track the orientation of each sensor. Now, when we track or attach the sensors to the user's body segments, we can determine the orientation of each body segment. That affords us the ability to track the orientation of the body segments, but not necessarily the position. So what we do is we combine anthropometric data, such as the user's total height and their hip height, along with principles of biomechanics and human kinematics to determine how the user is moving through the physical space. So while the IMUs provide us the information about the orientation of the body segments, these two aspects combined together let us know how the user is moving through the physical space based on their footsteps. This now allows us to propel them through the virtual space in the same correspondence as they would expect from the real world. Now to demonstrate this system and exactly what it's capable of, here's a little video. So this is my PhD student, Coleman. Notice he can still look around the virtual world like he could uh, in any of the other systems. But now he has a full body virtual avatar. This full body virtual avatar is controlled one to one to the IMU sensors. So as the IMUs are tracking his, the orientations of his body segments, we can map these onto his virtual avatar. Using the anthropometric data about his total height and his hip height, in addition to human kinematics, such as when he's taking a step, we can use this information to propel him through the virtual world very similarly to what he walks through the real world. Now, what this allows us to do, one, is we are no longer tethered to the lab, right? We can bring this technology outside of the lab and take it anywhere because these sensors are wireless and they'll pretty much work with uh, any machine. In addition, we now have full body interactions. So you can imagine we can kick down a virtual door if we wanted to. Um, while this technology is really advanced, we still have a few challenges that we're facing in the near future. One of the challenges that we have is currently we're using this T-pose to calibrate our system. So in other words, we have to calibrate the orientation of the sensors to the user's body segments. This works fairly well for the most part. However, if the user slightly leans a little bit in the T-pose or they twist an arm, they'll notice certain artifacts that break their sense of presence while they're in the immersive experience. So for instance, if they were uh, touch their physical hands together, they may notice that their virtual hands aren't actually contacting. We're planning to address this by looking at alternative poses and maybe even using multiple poses in addition to some other ideas on technologies and uh, concepts. Now another major issue is our system is inertia based. Um, these systems are prone to drift, which is uh, basically error accumulation. So every single time these sensors make a measurement, they're pretty accurate but there's a small little aspect of inaccuracy there, right? Well, as you pull this over and over and over, these inaccuracies build up to the point where eventually the orientation you think you have isn't the orientation that you actually have in the physical world. Um, this is drift. Now, researchers have been looking at drift and how we can tackle the problem. However, we're taking a new approach because we are very focused on the biomechanics and anthropometrics 
we're planning to build prediction models based on the known human kinematics to reduce drift. Now, in addition to reducing drift, another major issue for this technology to bring it to your home is ergonomics. Currently, we use 17 IMU sensors to do the tracking. Now, this takes about five minutes for users to put on. Now, I'm willing to bet maybe for the first time you would be willing to put 17 sensors on to experience immersive virtual reality, but I'm willing to bet that you wouldn't be willing to do it on a daily basis, okay? So obviously, we have to fix this aspect. One th way that we're planning to address this is to integrate these sensors into articles of clothing. So as you could see, we could integrate the upper body sensors into a jacket, we could integrate the lower body sensors into some coverall pants, and now you only have to put on two articles of clothing as opposed to 17 sensors. Now in the distant future, we can imagine that these sensors are going to become so small, and hopefully this technology will become so ubiquitous, that when you go to the mall to buy an article of clothing, these sensors may already be integrated into the clothing so that you can pair your clothing to your system. Now, another major issue that we have to fight with is real-world collisions. Remember, we do virtual reality. So the user might be in this huge, immersive virtual world, and there's no obstacles at all in front of them. However, they are most likely standing in their living room with a coffee table, right? So we have to make sure the user is safe, and they're not going to trip over that coffee table. So we have to find ways of avoiding real-world collisions. Um, Quickly off the bat, we're thinking maybe we can stick a camera in the environment, pre-detect where these real-world objects are, and help redirect the user in their virtual experience to avoid the objects. Now, in the near future, we're planning to employ our technologies for training. Uh, two main areas that we're currently focused on are the mining and construction fields and the healthcare industry. So in mining and construction, there's a lot of safety issues, and many of these safety issues relate directly to psychomotor tasks, such as climbing a ladder or operating machinery. Because we can track the full body interactions of the user and we can immerse them in their virtual world, we can now achieve training technologies that are much more realistic and more likely to afford good psychomotor skills than before. And for the healthcare industry, you can imagine now we can teach nurses how to put on their personal protective equipment and how to drape the uh, robot during the surgeries. But ultimately, in 10 years, our real goal is to bring this technology to your home. Thank you. <laughs>